Welcome to Legacy Conversations, a channel where we preserve military memories and history. Hello Internet. I must tell you I'm excited and, and I'm very excited because we're busy with uh, 7 Met, you know, the Special Forces Support Unit. And 7 Met has a fellow which is uh, a Honoris Crux holder. And I've been hearing about Bruce Fittler for a while, even before we started with a series, I've heard the name. And it's a man which was magnificent. There's no other words uh, to describe him. And as luck would have it, we've got his sister here, Debbie. She's going to speak to us just now. We've got a, a mate of his also, Wayne, Wayne Olo, who's also going to speak about the man. And we're going to see if we can get to know Bruce a bit better and what happened to him. And of course, that means that Wayne will have to tell us where he comes from through Seven Met and so forth. So we're combining the, the episodes. And I want to thank my guests. I want them to, to, to thank them for coming here. And I want to invite all of you listening, come and talk to us. And if you have lost a brother or a father or somebody, come to us and let us talk about it. Let they not disappear into the, you know, the void of time. Let us talk about him here, and perhaps our story will help others who are in the same situation. War is brutal. War is horrible. Let me tell you, unless you've been there, unless you've seen the dead, unless you've smelled the dead, uh, you don't quite understand. Uh, it's not like Hollywood. It's not like a first shooter game. It's something to be avoided. But anyway, let us talk about Bruce. Debbie, you're so welcome here. Thank you. Can you tell me a little bit of your early life of, of, of Bruce? I suppose he was your older brother. Uh, can you tell yeah. us about him? I can. Um, he was the youngest of five children. Um, I had an older brother, Michael Garth Fiddler. Michael Fiddler, Garth Fiddler. My sister, Brenda. And then it was me and Bruce came afterwards. And I'm six years older than him. And the two older brothers were 16 and 14 when he was born. And as it turned out, I just adored him and I embraced him right from a little baby. And we were very, very close, Bruce and I. And um, he was uh, born in the Johannesburg area and then we moved to Florida. And he went to Florida Primary and then Florida Park High where he became head boy. Um, he also was the captain of the rowing club, and he played uh, rugby as well for, for the first team. Um, but extramurally as well, he water skied and he ran, he did athletics. He was a very big man um, and started off, obviously, as a big child. And I think just his... Um, because he was so big he, and ran, he would just win anything anyway because he had longer legs and big strides and so on. But whatever he did, he, he excelled at. And um, he initially, when he was a little boy, he wanted to become a vet. He was very, very um, interested in it. Um, and his love for animals, he, he adored animals. He had chickens and ducks and named them all. And uh, he had a duck called Sandra. Um, and we went allowed to call her Sandra. And it was a huge thing for him. But all along, um, he had pellet guns. And his one friend accidentally actually shot Bruce in the chest area here. And it, it was quite a deep penetration. And the next, it was a Friday, and my mom took him to the doctor. And the next day, he had a big walk. He needed to have it cut out. It was quite close to his lung. He said, I can't do it now. He says, I've got a big walk, and I've got sponsors. And um, you need to let me do this big walk. Anyway, she agreed to it, and he was adamant about it. And she dropped him off. He did the big walk to a certain place. She picked him up from there, took him for x-rays, came back, dropped him off, and he finished his 
his uh, big walk so he could get the money that he he had committed to doing. Then he only had the operation on the Monday. And uh, that was what he did. Um, he remained friends with the boy who shot him as well. Um, he landed actually up in the same uh, team as Bruce. Um, in their 19, Bruce matriculated in 1980. And in their 79, 1980 year, they won every single regatta. Um, they also landed up as rowing for the Transvaal, for Transvaal colours, for provincial colours, and they got them. Um, Bruce was also um, awarded academic colours in his matric year as well. So he was quite an intelligent guy, which I think you all know, Wayne, as well. Um, he was a magnificent, as you say, person. He just was, it was black or white, there was no grey area. There was an incident at primary school as well. He was, he was in grade one and I was in Senate five. And there was an altercation on the field. And I ran down on the field of big fights. And um, it was Bruce. And he was just lying there. And this guy was climbing into him. And he had a nosebleed and he was quite beaten up. And I said to him, what on earth is going on? And of course, I took them to the principal and Bruce to the sick room. And I said to him, why did you not retaliate? I said, what is wrong with you? He said, I'm in my school uniform and you don't behave that way in your school uniform. So he was quite principled, you know, from that point of, from that young age already. Um, as I say, it was definitely uh the interest that he had in the army was one thing, but on the other hand, he was a placid guy. He didn't look for altercations. He would rather debate issues. Um, there was another incident in matric, um, which is, uh, I just need to tell you about. Somebody uh, said something to him about me. And Bruce wasn't happy about that. And he said to him afterwards, I will meet you after school at the bicycle sh uh, sheds. We can talk about it. And he turned his head, looking around, and this guy punched him in the mouth and broke off his tooth. And um, he had to have a, his tooth capped. Of course, once that happened, then Bruce retaliated. So from the grade one where he didn't uh, fight in his school uniform, he did whilst he was in the trick. And it was to defend me. So that was, I felt quite good about that, actually. However, um, that broken tooth story we'll, we'll get to. Um, after the trick, he got a bursary and he went to Wits and he did his uh, BCom degree. And that was why he was only 20, almost 21, when he started in the Special Forces. And because of his degree, he was assigned to do a two-year stint in admin. And I was married to um, a man at the time who had been to the border four times. And each time he had come back from the border, he was different and PTSD, of course, huge. It was never ever addressed by the army or by anybody and even by himself right up until the end. Um, he I begged Bruce to not fly to go to the special forces. I pleaded and I begged him and he just said I'm doing it. I've applied. I have uh, if I get, uh, he says, I'm fit enough, I'm intelligent enough, and Debbie, if they want me, I'm there. And he did um, one thing, give his life for something that he at least believed in, I think is some, some sort of, um, you know, he was in the army of his own accord. It wasn't that he was killed and he didn't want to be there, if I can put it that way. It didn't make it any easier for us, of course. 
My father blamed him, con- blamed himself con- constantly about it because my dad was in the um, citizens' active force or the active citizens' force. It's, I think it's called the ACF, and he was the commandant of the Transvaal uh, horse. Now I've got everything confused now. Sorry, he was of the THA. This oh man, sorry, Transvaal Horse Artillery. My dad was a commandant, and he was uh, Frederick William Fiddler was my father. Fought in the First World War, of course, and he met. That's where he met uh, Ivan Pierce, and they were in the artillery at the time. Uh, that's where, what they were doing, and he and Ivan became firm friends, and they kept in touch throughout their lives. And they uh, had a, Ivan and his wife had a son called Peter, who married a girl called Jane Oram, and her brother was Charles Oram, who landed up with Bruce later on in life. After Bruce was killed, my mother kept his car for some time, and she then sold it to Charles. And then we know later on that he was killed in that motor car and my mom was phoned. This was before Bruce's body was returned to say that your son has been killed in a motor car accident. And, of course, it was awful for my mom. And But we found out it was Charles as well. It was terrible anyway because it was just tragic as well. Um, so... Just going back to my father, he blamed himself all the time because we were always involved in going to parades in our youth with my dad. Um, So he, we told him afterwards it's not his fault. Bruce was hell-bent on it. He, He was highly principled, and that's what he wanted to do. So, yes, um, that was, that's, a bit of the story of Bruce is, you know, he did. What else did he do? Oh yes, one little knit, little thing. When he wanted to be a vet, he went to the mine dumps. We lived near the mine dumps in Florida, and he found a skeleton of a cat, and he brought it home, and he boiled it in a coffee tin. Fortunately, not in any of the pots that we made food in. And he pieced this cat together with a wire and he mounted it on a on a stand. Very proud of him. I mean, he was about eight or nine, I think, at the time that he did that. And yeah, that was Bruce. When he decided to do something, he did it properly. Anyway, he however changed his mind later on in life when he realized that he was quite bright as well and he just changed his degree decision. And, you know, sadly for me, he didn't go and do the admin job. Um, We miss him every, every day. And, in fact, he would, this Friday, the 23rd of February, he would have turned 61. And he was 22 years old when he was killed in 1985. I think the fact that this is called Legacy Conversations is very apt uh, in the case of, of Bruce because he definitely left a, a legacy, yeah. Um, and, yeah, I think it's it's fitting that we're honouring him this way. Um, he's definitely revered within 7 Medical Battalion Group. Um, yeah, the... Uh, a lot of my juniors, I suppose, uh, have asked me to do something on Bruce. So, uh, yeah, thanks for, for hosting us, Chris. Um, yeah. So I suppose I need to give a bit of background. I was actually the intake before Bruce. Um, so Bruce would have gone in in January 84. I was July 83. Um, and I'd been born and bred in uh, Rhodesia. Um, I had cousins, uncles, my own father, very much involved with the Rhodesian army. So in school, all I wanted to do was try out for the Rhodesian Light Infantry. 
Um, that was my career goal, right? And unfortunately, um, the war ended um, before I finished school. So I thought, well, what's the next best thing? And later when we moved to South Africa, I thought, well, I'll, I'll try to become a parabat. Um, I, I thought that was probably the closest equivalent to the Rhodesian Light Infantry. So one parachute battalion I set my, my sights on and volunteered for national service um, in order to do that. Now, when you volunteer for national service, you get to choose the unit that you can do your basics at. And I was pretty naive. I, I didn't really know what basics was. Um, had a girlfriend at the time. So I thought, well, I'll choose something near Joburg, which where she was. And so I decided I'll go to medics in Clip Drift. And, yeah, arrived in Clip Drift, one of the coldest places I've ever been to in my life. And typical Rhodesian, I was wearing fellies and short shorts, no socks. Um, met a guy called Jim. And throughout this, I haven't got everybody's permission to talk, so I'm just going to use first names or nicknames. Um, uh, and Jim lent me a pair of rugby socks in the queue yep, while we were queuing up, uh, which was great. And Jim eventually went right the way through with me and is still a firm friend of mine. But um, one of the first questions I asked was, when did the Parabats come to do selection? I need to find out they didn't. They didn't bother going to medics to select people because the Bats felt that it was probably more economical for them to take jump qualified parabats and send them to medical training than to select medics. So there was my plan pretty much shot. So I immediately started to try and move to an infantry unit so I could go for parabat selection. When um, one of our officers said to me, we've got this crowd called special forces coming around in a few days' time. Maybe you should hang around and, yeah. And wait for them. So uh, we all lined up on the parade ground one morning and uh, Dakota came in really low and uh, five or six people jumped out of the deck and I was already sold. Um, yeah, and then they had a whole lot of uh, uh, weapons set up and, uh, and basically asked for volunteers um, and did a little bit of running and... Uh, buddy PT and stuff like that and managed to get in by the skin of my teeth. And, and literally I did to that that initial special forces selection from medics because uh, they said they were only looking for 10 people. I was the 11th carrying a guy who was a bit bigger than me, um, scarf draw you know, over the shoulders and didn't make it. Uh, and then he started trying to climb off my shoulders. And I said, no ways, I'm still carrying you over that line because uh, they'd called it was over and staggered across the line with him. And so they added an 11th name to the list, which yeah, I was pretty happy about. So they took 11 of us. Um, and Special Forces didn't do their own basics in uh, uh, July. So we moved from uh, Clip Drift to infantry school. Uh, did our basics there. Uh, group of 11 of us, as I said, and, um, yeah, infantry school, tough place. <laughs> he did a lot of running, which was good. Um, uh, but, yeah, it, it really I, – I, I learned a lot at infantry school, um, and uh, I felt sorry for our roommates as well because – we weren't really that motivated to become officers. We were with hotel company. We just wanted to get fit so we could have a good crack at uh, special forces. Um, so we weren't that serious about our, our inspections and stuff like that. So a lot of people did a lot of running because of us. Um, but, uh, but yeah, eventually we left infantry school and went to Sam's College where um, – uh, Special Forces did pre-selection, and I actually didn't make it to the uh, list of people that were going to go to do uh, Special Forces operator selection, but instead I was assigned to what was known as Medical Detachment Special Operations at that stage. 
So that was people that were giving support to special forces. And at that stage, it was pretty piecemeal. I think it would have been ops medics that had later qualified to do their wings or doctors that had become jump qualified. Or, um, yeah, there was no real set process for what would later become 7Med. And I think we were the first group as an experiment to look at that. So we started off, we didn't do the ops medic training. We did a, a specialized medical training course, which included trauma, advanced life support, uh, remote medicine, stuff like that. And, and we had some really good training grounds. Um, uh, a lot of theory through one of the uh, the staff sergeants um, who would had worked with the Rhodesian SAS and um, and our RSM was also um, ex Rhodesian, so uh, really good quality training from a theory point of view. And then we would go to California Hospital to learn the practical side of things, and yeah. You couldn't ask for a better training ground because you saw everything at Catoslan. Um, yeah, so I amputated limbs, patched up people left, right, and centre. Um, yeah, we we really learnt a lot at, at Catoslan, and then also at One Mall around more the longer term life support. And the reason for that was, as an ops medic, I think you train mainly for that golden hour. Uh, keep your patient alive until the the Kazabak chopper arrives, um, and so it's, the focus is on that. But if you're in uh, supporting airborne or special forces operations, you may not have the luxury of having a Kazabak. So you'd have to work at keeping your your patient alive a lot longer. Um, so some really good training there, and then we were sent off to do the Parabat uh, PT course. Um, and our ranks had swelled a bit by then because we did have a couple of infantry guys that had joined us as well who'd been selected um, for medical detachment special operations rather than the uh, the uh, special forces um, operator selection. And so probably a group of about 15 of us um, went through to Parabat PT course. We were pretty confident. We were motivated. We'd be training ourselves. and um, But PT course is tough, let me tell you. <laughs> Back in those days, it was the two-week PT course. Um, and, yeah, I, I picked up an injury on the first Friday uh, running around rifle PT. So I stretched the the nerve in my arm here, uh, what medically is known as a subcutaneous neuropraxy, and so I lost my bicep. My bicep was just hanging, so I managed to make it to the following Wednesday, but then was medically discharged. Um, yeah, uh, if I could have hung on, probably another half a day, I probably would have been able to do the actual PT tests at a later point. But yeah, medically discharged. Um, and a friend of mine who had come along, he had uh, actually had heat exhaustion. He fell off, fell off as well, a guy called John B, I'll call him. And yeah, so we, we headed back, but we were pretty determined to get at least some jumps in before our colleagues had remained. So five guys finished the course. Um, and did the hangar phase and, and jump qualified. But John and myself you know, went skydiving that weekend just so we could say to them when we finally saw them again, well, at least we jumped before you because they had a two-week hangar phase still coming up. Um, and, yeah, after that, um, basically, um, yeah, I was, I was sort of doing – bicep curls with one kilogram weights for a while just to get my uh, my bicep function in again. And then it was on the job training. So I think because we were an experimental group, they were trying to see what what was needed for a uh, 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 special forces airborne support medic. Um, so for instance, you know, if you want to learn about being a Kazakh medic, we'll go to Ondangwa and become a Kazakh medic. That was the kind of training that we did. Um, if you want to do remote medicine, go to 
Beacon 16 in my case. Uh, Jim went to Beacon 10, and while he was at Beacon 10, he had a whole platoon of jump qualified goats that he trained up. Um, used to drop them out of the tower with a 120 millimeter uh, loom mortar shoot. So, yeah, that, that kind of sums Jim up. I could tell lots of stories about Jim, but yeah. <laughs> Maybe another time. Yeah, this is more about Bruce, just giving some background here. And then we also did some time with uh, 101 Battalion, uh, the Special Service Corps, the Riachsi uh, Mak, the Romeo Mikes, as they're commonly known. Um, and, yeah, and then basically I still wasn't jump qualified. Um, so the one way of getting jump qualified is actually to do selection. So... I volunteered for operator selection um, with two other comrades, one who was jump qualified, uh, Doug, and then John B, who who had kind of dropped off the uh, PT course with me. And that's where I first met Bruce, because Bruce was doing, basically, he'd finished um, basics. And so we met at, again, pre-selection at, at Sam's College. So my first impressions of Bruce was don't mess with him. <laughs> he was a big boy, right? When he cut dice with me, yeah, yeah. So, um, so, but later found out what a nice guy. I mean, yeah, Debbie mentioned intelligent. Um, people were drawn to me. He definitely had leadership quality, um, and yeah, I got to know him better as we we kind of went along. We were both slightly older than than the other people as well around us. And uh, I think, yeah, we, we chatted quite a bit. And the other thing I really found quickly about Bruce is, as Debbie said, yeah, that 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 everything was black and white. He was he was highly principled, um, didn't tolerate injustice. Um, and one of the first I suppose route marches that we did uh, in in training around the the Rustenburg Plurf area um, uh, probably proved that. So we're carrying basically heavy bergens up and down um, uh, hills and valleys and and what have you. But one of the first things that that we had a break once, and Bruce suddenly miraculously had these cold grapes that he pulled out of his bergen. So he'd gone and raided the officer's kitchen before we went on the walk, found these cold grapes, kept them in his fire bucket, and we were really, like, exhausted there. He miraculously appeared with these cold grapes, which was 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 great. The other thing I remember, one of my colleagues broke the frame on his bergen, and Bruce basically fixed it, you know, took a branch, stuffed it in the 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 tube uh, frames, joined it together um, so that he could carry on walking. But a little bit later, I, I can't remember exactly what happened, but Bruce had an argument with one of the instructors because he felt the instructors were being unfair on somebody. So the instructor found a really big stump for Bruce to carry. So on top of all of the weight that he was carrying a rifle, they gave him a stump as well. Um, and so Bruce put at the top of his bergen. There is a photo of that. Um, but if that wasn't enough, uh, about an hour later, Bruce found took exception to some other perceived injustice, and so he got given a second stunt. So eventually we called that walk fiddler's follies because, yeah, we, we just felt that. But Bruce, give him credit, never backed down, never asked for a hand, um, just carried on walking with two heavy stumps, his full bergen and rifle. Um, <clears throat> then we went to one reconnaissance regiment in Durban for a while before going to individual phase at Duku Duku. And I was fortunate enough to share a basher with, with Bruce, um, which I think sort of gave me a lot of motivation as well. Um, yeah. So, yeah, we we sort of cucked off, we sweated a lot, we bled some. But in that basher at night with Bruce, we had a lot of music and laughter, right? Bruce uh, 
Bruce had a ghetto blast there. He loved his music. Um, and he'd often have it on his shoulder at night at the basher. Not too loud because he didn't want the instructors to hear, but like dancing around and yeah, just a, a really, really great sense of humor Bruce had as well. So we, we laughed a lot, right? I remember once I, I, I did a rather gross fight that really stank the place out. And Bruce straight away started uh, singing the Yes song then, saying, Wayne is the owner of a smelly fart rather than broken heart. So that's the kind of guy he was, just you know, quick on the ball, just just good fun. And, and like I said, a, a, a big lad who, um, yeah, uh, used to leave me behind whenever we did route marches. We did a lot of those. I wouldn't see Bruce again till the end. He'd be up front. So my strategy was was more to be the grey man, to not be noticed. That just wasn't in Bruce's nature. His nature was just to excel in everything that he did. Um, so he was definitely noticed by everybody. One of our instructors there we called the devil, um, the devil, because he's, he's – mission in life was to make your life miserable and he was very good at his mission <laughs> and Dave and Bruce um I think eventually had had a lot of respect for each other um but yeah that Bruce was often just yeah running around right I remember once we were having lunch and Bruce had committed some misdemeanor so he was running around with a, a mag uh, a general purpose machine gun above his head. So it's bad enough with your 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 sort of rifle. We use G3s there. But uh, with a mag, it would have been pretty hellish. And Bruce was running around having to sort of repeat this phrase time and time again, Ekasa, I won't say it, but yeah, the whole time he's running around. But what was quite funny is every time he came around to where we were, he had suddenly have a big smile and wink at us, which caused us to laugh uproariously, which made the instructors even madder at him. <laughs> so, yeah, that, again, I think just, just gives you to some idea of, of Bruce's personality and his never-say-die attitude. Um, so he continued to bear, bear the burden of, of uh, I suppose, just being – a stand-up guy, right? He'd never back down. He'd always try to support uh, his his comrades. Um, before selection, though, he was the instructor's favourite to pass. I, I, I took umbrage to that because <laughs> they'd come into our basher and say, Bruce, our money's on you. <laughs> You've got to pass, right? <laughs> so they were, everyone took bets as to who was going to pass selection, and I think Bruce was by far and away the favourite. Um in individual phase as well, you you have to rank the three people that you would go to war with the most and the three that you would go to war with the least. And I think Bruce topped that poll by a long way as well, right? So, so come to selection then. And um, you know, I didn't see much of Bruce on selection. I was I was with a, a, a different team. Um and selection is basically uh, four days of, of uh, hell. Um, and, uh, yeah, you, you, you start off uh, the whole premise is that you are swapper behind enemy lines and that the, the Burra are looking for you. Um, you've got to transport various items, uh, like you have a drum, 44-gallon drum filled with water that you've got to move. Um, so there's always something going on there, and again, a lot of lot of uh, night navigation. Uh, you don't sleep, you don't eat for four days. Um, part of that as well is that you actually get captured by the enemy, um, and I knew this was coming in our group, and we were all called together, and I I thought well. I'd heard that this is going to happen, and I thought, well, I'll, I'm going to try to run for it if it does. I didn't even see the guys. They were just on us, boom, like that. Um, so you get a hood put on you, 
hands handcuffed behind your back, thrown in the back of a vehicle, and you get taken off to interrogation. And interrogation is your handcuff to a pole. It's the middle of the night. You've got a canvas hood over your head, and they just throw in freezing cold water over you. And then they'll take you inside briefly. They give you a cover story. So the cover story is that your fisherman washed up and you managed to find these weapons and you weren't intending to use them. Most of us just kept quiet. I mean, I didn't say anything. It was nice to be there under the, the bright lights of the interrogation room, actually, because it was a bit warm. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and yeah, they, 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 and I was one of the first guys in. I didn't say anything. Um, I just kind of waited and they took me back outside, handcuffed me to the pole again, threw more cold water over me, and then Bruce went in. And it's quite interesting given what happened in that Bruce basically said to the instructors, this is BS. He said, um, yeah, if you guys are prepared to do this to us as part of just our training, if I ever get captured by the enemy, I'm just going to spill the beans. Yeah, this is a waste of time. Um, typical Bruce just yeah, telling it how he felt, um, that this was a stupid exercise, that, yeah, it, it wouldn't prepare you for the real thing. And later on in his special forces cycle, he would have done more advanced resistance to interrogation training. But at that stage, I really thought, you know, Bruce, just keep quiet. You're blowing this. You're not going to get <laughs> selected at this. But obviously, the instructors quite liked that. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, and then eventually, yeah, at some stage, they tell you, right, we're going to, we're doing another long route march. Um, and suddenly you come around the corner and there's a table full of beers and food. And then they say selection's over. And, you know, one beer and you're, you're kind of off with the fairies because it's. <laughs> The first thing you've had in uh, in sort of four days, and uh, yeah, it was yeah. And then you go back and you shower and you have some food, and then they they split you up into different groups. And as soon as they put me in one group, and I saw Bruce in another group, I knew I hadn't passed. So yeah, because uh, I knew Bruce had passed selection, and that's exactly what happened. So I'm sort of trailed psychologically. Um, Bruce passed, um, John B, who was there, passed as well. Um, Doug, the other guy, went there also, uh, failed physically, failed um, selection. So, yeah, Bruce went off to Special Forces training cycle. So I remember got back to one recce and they all kitted out to go to the next part of their, their cycle. And um, that's where I met Charles Oram as well, who, who Debbie spoke about earlier for the first time as well. Yeah, you know, they were all given red AR-70s. They had, like, the flash kit, um, you know, all the gooky stuff. <laughs> and they were going to go off now to do, uh, to do basically, yeah, uh, everything leading up to minor tactics. So, uh, yeah, um, but, uh, yeah, um, I think first course for them would have been foreign weapons. Um, and then they would have done yeah, demolitions, dark phase, um, uh, everything that uh, uh, medical training, that's important as well because, yeah, um, uh, Bruce would have gone through medical training, so that's important later as well. And meanwhile, I was uh, ITU'd back to, uh, to medical detachment special operations. Um, I went back to 101 Romeo Mike's, um, had a brief stint at 4 Recce at Langabon, which was interesting as well. I still wasn't jump qualified though, so uh, I was there with Jim. So Jim did a, a couple of water jumps, but I was just the other medic on the boat. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and then we went to 5-1 Reconnaissance Commando at um, uh, Ondangwa, Fort Rev. That was interesting as well. Um, supported them um, in pseudo ops. And then, luckily enough, I applied for jump course again and was accepted. So I got to do my second PT course um, with uh, with Parabats. Uh, did hangar phase and finally got my wings. Um, yeah. Uh, 
So that was uh, quite something. Normally as well, you, there were some um, some special forces uh, candidates there that had passed election. So uh, I confused the, the officer commanding one parachute battalion because he'd come around and asked PT course or selection to everybody. And when he got to me, I said both. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he would like kind of looked at me quizzically and, and did ask me a few questions about that. But yeah, yeah. Because I'd always figured, yeah, I passed physically. I should have just been able to go straight away to hangar phase, but no, I'd PT course again. So yeah. Um, and then we went and did fire force and, and lunar ops with, with bats as well. We were always volunteering right. for stuff. And Bruce actually failed minor tactics. Um, so, yeah, the last hurdle uh, to becoming a, a special forces operator, he, he didn't quite make it. Um, and he was ITU'd to 44 Parachute Brigade, although he had never had any affiliation with 44. But obviously he was highly trained, jump qualified. But 44 didn't know what to do with Bruce. Um, they put him in charge of the car park at Murray Hill much to Bruce's chagrin. And we used to catch up with Bruce on passes occasionally. He was the most qualified car park guard ever. Um, and, yeah, so we would meet him in, in Hillbra, yeah, with his girlfriend and, uh, yeah, have a few beers. And he was obviously hearing everything that we were up to. And he just wanted to get into the action, right? Um, and... So I suggested that he apply for 7 Med. We'd actually were close to clawing out at this stage um, and there were no jump qualified medics to take our place. Um, so Bruce would have fit the bill. He had done medical training as part of his special forces operator cycle. He was jump qualified. Um, so I suggested he speak to our operational um, uh, officer commanding um, which he did, and we then clawed up. Yeah, um, and uh, yeah, it was about not long after we clawed out. I actually went to um, a friend's place. So uh, yeah, uh, September we clawed out in in June, and he had the new Gary Moore album. Um, and I'm a big fan of Gary Moore. So he said, come around, we'll listen to it, we'll have a few beers. And in those days, he had one of those really sophisticated hi-fis that when the, the song has ended, it used to jump to the radio automatically. And I was listening to Gary Moore's Out in the Fields uh, and thinking of Bruce. Thinking, yeah, I wonder what Bruce is up to now. I wonder what's happening out in the fields. Um, you know, and, and the line of the song is death is only a heartbeat away. And the the album ended and it went to the news and it was straight away, you know, security forces regret to announce the death of Corporal Bruce Fiddler. I couldn't believe it. Um, but, yeah, but that's that's just what happened there. So, yeah, yeah. Um, and then there were all these coincidences around Bruce after that as well. I started a new job as a, a, a pharmaceutical representative uh, with a company. And Bruce's sister-in-law, Cheryl, was actually the secretary who worked for my boss, basically, our, our regional sales manager. And I asked her, I said, Fiddler, that's an unusual name. Are you related to Bruce? And she had married Bruce's brother, Garth, who Debbie mentioned earlier. Um, and that's when I started finding out that that the story that perhaps had come out that that the military had told them was not strictly the story that I knew. Um, and and I might let Debbie explain more about that. Um, about Bruce and Wayne mentioned about how he loved music. He did, and we were we always had music in the home. Our parents um, used to have music appreciation afternoons uh, my dad would play Beethoven for instance and you'd say right how many instruments do you hear and then we'd say oh four or five or whatever it was 
Jesus. And then he'd say, right, name them, you know. So we had that very early, you don't just hear the music, you actually listen to it. And that's now quite relevant to what Wayne says. You're actually listening to the lyrics of a song. I don't, I, I when I hear music, I also have worked in the music industry now as well for a long time. And it's not about just each song and the tune and the melody. It's about the story that they're telling in the song. Well, that was in the earlier days. I don't know about the music now, but yeah. So we grew up with music, and Bruce was in grade two when Led Zeppelin became famous. And he would talk about Led Zeppelin, but our older brothers had bought the album. And all of the people at school, at his school, they were like, who are you talking about, you know? And all the way through his schooling, of course, now everybody knows them. Um, and I have been very fortunate for the uh, 40th school reunion. They invited me to go with for the weekend on Bruce's behalf. And it was very, very touching to go there. And, of course, they also spoke about him in um, very high, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, regard. They saw him as a complete and as a leader. And just also on that note, at the end of his matric year, he said to me, I don't think anybody likes me. So I said, why would you say such a thing? So he said, because he did his job well. You know, he was, do this or you'll get into trouble for it or whatever. Anyway, when they got their numbers, they actually, he said to a few friends, let's go to my house. Tell everybody, spread the word. Well, everybody pitched up. And my mom and dad arrived home to 100, oh, about 80 kids there. Their deep freeze and fridge was empty. They had bribed everything. They had drunk every bit of liquor that was in my father's um, bar. Of course, they had been to, done their own shopping and so on. So anyway, afterwards, I said to Bruce, oh, I thought nobody liked you, you know. He, was, so he just had this little sort of smile on his face. Um, and then another thing, he liked to travel. And he didn't have much money, obviously, because he went from school, got a bursary, sort of worked for the company for a while while he was on back. But the one time my brother, lived, my brother Mike lived in uh, Peter Maritzburg, so him and his girlfriend at the time, they decided they'd go and see Mike for a while. Anyway, of course, it doesn't take you very long from Joburg to get to Maritzburg. My mother phones after about six hours and says, Bruce, there. Mike says, no, he's not. Mom, I don't know where you, we haven't heard. Of course, it was long before cell phones. They drove past Mount Majuba, and they decided to climb it. Bruce and Jean, and they climbed to the top of Mount Majuba, climbed down again, got in the car, completely oblivious to all the panic that was going on, arrived at my brother's house. Mike was like, where the heck have you been? And Bruce was like, well, it was there, so we did it, you know. That was what, the kind of guy was so funny. Um, and another thing, Garth and he went on holiday to Zimbabwe, and they went fishing, tiger fishing. And my mom had just had a brain tumor removed. So they shaved her head. And my father was bald. Anyway, Garth had a good head of hair, and so did Bruce. At, uh, you know, obviously in the army, you knew him as a, with shorter hair, right? But uh, he, his hair was longer, had a mustache, whatever. Anyway, on their way home, they met some girl somewhere. And she was looking for a lift back to South Africa. So anyway, she was in the back. The two guys are in the front. Not much talking going on. So she says eventually, she said, I'm just looking at the two of you. You've both got beautiful hair. Do you get it? You know, who do you get it from, your mom or your dad? So that Garth says, well, my, our dad's bald. So Bruce says, well, so is our mom. And, of course, just left it completely like that because – Obviously, her hair grew back and it was as thick as it was before. But they never explained it to this poor girl. And that's Bruce. He, he just would say something humorous 
and then just leave it there. You know, he was really, he had a good sense of humor. And the most wonderful laugh, he he had a, it was, I miss that. I, I must say, I do that. I do miss that. However, going back now to the family's reaction, I was living in East London at the time, and the, he phoned me on the 12th of, of September to say goodbye. He was leaving the next day to go up north. And he phoned to go, say goodbye, and I cried and whatnot, and just said, be careful. You've only got three months left. Please, I'm begging you, Bruce. Anyway, he went out on that op and was killed on the allegedly on the fifteenth, which was the fifteenth, which was the the Sunday. On the Tuesday afternoon, my mother had been working in the garden and had a swim, and then had put on a dress. And we lived on a corner on a T junction, or they did rather, and. This military vehicle drove down to the T. She watched it and she was like, no, no, please don't. And did a U-turn and came and parked outside the gate. And she knew, of course. My dad was at work and obviously she contacted him and what have you. We didn't have a telephone at home and I was about to leave work to go home. And luckily my brother, then Michael, got hold of me to tell me that this had happened. Well, the shock was enormous. I collapsed actually onto the floor. And apparently I, I went white. I, I, I just, it was the worst news ever. And I immediately, of course, wanted to come back to Joburg, be with my parents. And anyway, got into flight the next morning, my daughter and I, and we flew up here. But on that Friday, at least on that Tuesday evening, my then husband and I drove, he drove me home. I couldn't drive. And my little daughter comes running out, hello, to see us. And of course, we stayed, both of us. Because when I met Anthony, my ex-husband, Bruce was in grade uh, two. So he actually saw him grow up to be a man. And they were very, very close as well. And the next thing, the police arrived at our house because they were frantic, my parents, that we would be watching the news on television, which everybody did in those days. And, of course, it was all over the place on TV. And they were scared that we had not heard yet about Bruce, but we had. But anyway, that's the length that they went to. And the police, of course, in those days were switched on. And uh, we watched it. And, of course, it was, again, surreal. I mean, it's just like not, this can't be true. The next morning, uh, the only flight I could get on was a business Light, look, business class, and you get newspapers. There's Bruce's face on the front page. We fly from East London to PE, pick up new people. I get a new newspaper also, all on the front page. All I did was cry all the way home. Garth met me at the airport. He was in a terrible state. We went home. I just saw my parents. It was just, I don't know. What do you say? to them. The support that we got, though, from friends and family and even strangers, other parents of other young men that had died came to visit, sent bouquets of flowers. It was incredible, absolutely incredible. They got over 40 bouquets and telegrams in those days and just phone calls constantly. It was just we were making tea all the time and trying to eat. You don't feel like eating. I, I cannot tell you the devastation that we felt. And then the army 
uh, told a whole bunch of lies. Every time they, you heard from them, it was a different story. So we never really ever found out the truth um, until his body was returned seven years later in the June. And in the meantime, my mom had passed away in the August of 91. So this was in June 1992, and my brother-in-law phoned me because he was the liaison with the army. And he said to me, your body had been turned, and do I know who Bruce's dentist is? My mother was dead, and my father was actually away for the month of August overseas. So I said to him, as a matter of fact, I do. I do know. So I went to the dentist, and they don't keep records longer than five years. So who knows when Bruce went to the dentist prior to him leaving to go to the army anyway, and this was seven years later. So now what? How do we identify him? And then I remembered about him defending my honor, actually, and the broken tooth. Now I said to Dirk, this is the tooth. This one here next to the, the front four on the left-hand side. If it's got a capped tooth, it's Bruce. And that's the way we identified him. And God said to me, how did you know that? So I said, because Bruce and I were like this. I knew everything about Bruce. When he was in matric, being head boy, he was invited to go to all the uh, matric dancers in the, in the area. Anthony was always on the border or whatever. I would often sleep over at my mom and dad's house. I'd be up and down pacing, waiting for him to come home. Like I was his parent. It was ridiculous. <laughs> That's the kind of relationship we had with each other. And when Anthony used to go to the border, Bruce used to come and stay at my house and look after me there. He was just phenomenal. He, he knocked on my door the one day. Chris Pryor had just played a song the night before. He was at university. And he said, you've got to listen to the song. I heard it last night while I was studying. I said to him, what have you, why are you studying with music on? This is not good enough, Bruce. You know, like sort of chastising him. He says, wait, you've got to hear the song. And it was Private Investigation by Dire Stress. You all know the song. It, so, of course, whenever I hear that, it takes me back. And then Owner of a Lonely Heart, when that, of course, by Yes with Trevor Rabin, one of Bruce's favorite songs. He got that for Christmas in 1984. He got that album, and he also got the album um, Abacab by Genesis. So, yeah, his music tastes varied. He loved heart as well. Um, he loved women. And, but he, he, he wasn't a big player. He didn't really date a lot of girls. He, he really didn't. But, yeah, so the truth was elusive. We never knew the truth. And then in once Bruce's uh, remains had been identified, uh, my dad decided, well, we'd have the a full military funeral on that day with the SA flag on and uh, whatnot. And all the moths were there as well. My dad was a member of the moths. It was uh, filmed by the BBC. But when this was now finalized, it was Bruce. It felt like seven years ago, it felt like it had just happened again. Those feelings of that despair that you feel and the, the pain in your body, you just, it just returned. It was like it had happened just then, again, you know, so we went through it twice. In, 19, in 1985, my mom and dad did have a memorial service, um, which was very well attended. Um, this one was then, obviously, the funeral was a coffin there. And yeah, it was hard. 
It was really hard. They played the last post, all of that. One thing I can say was at least my mom wasn't there. Um, but my poor dad was there. Also, I've left something out. Prior to Bruce's body being returned, because he was such a very um, good rower, they, the school bought four skulls. Now, Bruce never, ever rode in a skull. He always was in a four with a cox or an eight. But anyway, they bought four skulls, and they named one after Bruce and named one after another young man who was also head boy of that school who was killed in the army as well, and then two other guys. So we had a boat naming uh, ceremony held at Florida Lake where my mom actually christened Bruce's boat and the mother skull, not the boat, and the mother of the other soldier did the other one. It was very, very touching. We were all there, all of us, kids as well, and our, our own children. So, yeah, so that was that. Was that. Um, then my mom kept Bruce's car. She wanted to keep it for obvious, obvious reasons and then sold it to Charles Oram. As I said earlier, I mean, that was just how did this and this the families like intertwining all the way along. And uh, that was very, very sad. Um, have I lost my place? I think so. Once as well, uh, the body, they did an autopsy on it. They could find that he had been, he had been wounded, but he wasn't dead. And they captured him and then they tortured him. And then they executed him with a gunshot wound to the back of his head. Um, my father was then approached with to be accompanied by all of us children to go to the to Kimberley to receive the Honoris Crux Medal. And that was in the July of 1993. Uh, so we we went. Um, but sadly, I'm jumping around. Sorry about this. Bruce, Bruce's funeral was on the 15th of September 92. And six weeks later, on the 4th of December, our older brother, Michael, was hijacked and murdered as well. Um, he was 45. He left a wife and also five children. Um, not all of his own stepchildren, but some of his own. So that was also tra tragic, absolutely tragic. And he would have been 77 now. And he died at 45. I mean, it also broke that whole family up there. It was just crazy what what happened. I've been in touch with my nieces and nephews all along. They're still Michael's family. And the his little daughter, who was only seven at the time, she has moved to England where my brother Garth stays. And Garth and them are, he, he looks out for Sarah. He's, you know, make the circle bigger, of course. Um, I found a citation that was read at the awarding of the, of the Honoris Crux Medal to my dad. And they that was the first time that we really heard what had happened to Bruce. In a nutshell, I suppose, 
And also, if, you know, they had told so many untruths before, what else happened to him? And how quick was it? That's always the thing that bothers me. What did he go through? I mean, it must have been just awful. Yeah, I'd like to to read the the citation that that Debbie mentioned was uh, uh, read um, at Bruce's cremation, um, and well, it basically, uh, I think is the uh, supporting evidence for his uh, nomination for the Honoris Crooks. So. Uh, I'll just start off at the the action for which commended. Uh, During Operation Magneto, at about 2,300 hours on the night of 14 September 1985, two South African military vehicles were caught in an ambush in southern Angola. Most of the accompanying UNITA troops were killed, and of the three South African Defence Force members present, two uh, two artillery officers were able to escape. Corporal Fiddler, a trained reconnaissance operator and operational medical orderly, was left behind, presumed dead. The body of Corporal Fiddler was returned to South Africa in June 1992, and a post-mortem examination was carried out, which revealed beyond any doubt that Corporal Fiddler was captured alive, tortured, and then killed by a gunshot to the back of his head. These findings explain why his body was not returned with the prisoner of war exchange in 1988 when the world media were following proceedings. During Corporal Fiddler's training, he was instructed in the technique of misleading his interrogators by giving them as much irrelevant information as possible and by creating the impression that he is an officer and acquainted with the tactical situation. During his training, emphasis was placed, even when faced with torture, on the importance of not communicating, compromising the location of fellow soldiers whose safety in such situations depends entirely on remaining undetected. The fact that the Angolan authorities indicated that the remains of a captain in the South African Medical Services were found at the site of the ambush proved that he was alive at the time and that he had successfully used this technique to mislead his interrogators. Corporal Fiddler knew the location of five South African Defence Force doctors approximately 20 kilometres from the ambush site. He also knew that they were a relatively easy target for his captors, and with his training he knew he could also use this information to bargain for his life. No attack was subsequently launched on the medical officers deployed, close to the ambush site, confirming that Corporal Fiddler did not reveal the position of his fellow soldiers, even while being tortured. He died without disclosing this vital information. The above display of courage in the face of severe physical abuse and imminent death renders Corporal Fiddler a worthy recipient of the Honoris Crooks decoration posthumous. Corporal Fiddler's decoration will be received by his father, Mr. Fiddler. So that's the official citation, which I think first gave the indication of, um, I suppose, the bravery that Bruce exhibited, um, as well as the the brutality that that he endured. And I also know that he was originally nominated for Norris Crook's gold. Um, And there was a lot of confusion, actually, because at one stage we thought he had been awarded the Norris Crook's silver, um, but yeah, the Honoris Crooks, uh, and both of the artillery offer, officers who were with, with him on that uh, that action as well were also awarded the Honoris Crooks. <clears throat> and Bruce is actually uh, listed on the uh, uh, Role of Honour at one parachute battalion, as well as seven medical battalion group. Um, He's also uh, on the Airborne Memorial at the War Museum in Johannesburg and on the SADF Wall of Remembrance at Fort Trecher Monument. And I think this Sunday, Debbie is going to go lay a wreath um, for um, 
Bruce. Uh, she'll be attending as a guest of Seven Medical Battalion Group. So, yeah, I think, yeah, truth's always going to be the, the first casualty of war. Um, Ian Ace's book, Enduring Valor, um, I think describes the, the action um, probably as accurately as I know. Um, uh, I did post a tribute on the, the SA Role of Honor website, which I think is now defunct, which is a pity. Um, mm. And after I posted that tribute, um, I got feedback from uh, one of Bruce's uh, nieces, uh, and that's how I got in touch with the, the Fiddler family again. Um, and, yeah, they, they've been really good to me as well because I always had a little bit of guilt about persuading Bruce to join 7 Medical Battalion Group, but the, the family have kind of... Uh, allayed my fear, fears on that to a large degree by saying he would have done it anyway. <laughs> so, and mm. he probably, yeah, um, because that did bug me for a long time, yeah, that I was basically the guy that, yeah, um, I suppose created the the cascade of actions that led to his death. Um, I also got a, an email back from an artillery lieutenant who was meant to be on the vehicle that, that Bruce was on, but who was pulled off at the last moment because apparently there was an administrative um, error. He was listed as SA Infantry and not Artillery, and they had to sort that out first. So he also said he thinks about Bruce often because, yeah, he would have, he would have been there um, it, when they were ambushed. But... What was interesting in his email is he said, because they'd all attended the same briefings, that in that citation it just speaks about Bruce knowing the uh, location of five um, medical um, officers, would have been seven med as well. Um, but he said Bruce would have known a lot more than that. In fact, Bruce would have been privy to most of the order of battle. He would have known most of the South African artillery units that were deployed with uh, with UNITA, uh, including yeah, one five five millimeter uh, cannon and uh, uh, Roy Or Valkyrie rocket launchers. He said that Bruce would also uh, have known where South African intelligence um, um, operatives were. Um, so it wasn't just that surgical team of five to ten doctors that Bruce protected during his interrogation and torture. It was basically, yeah, almost the the whole uh, order of battle uh, for that Operation Magneto. Yeah, and and as that citation said as well, yeah, Bruce convinced his his captors that he was a captain and not a corporal. And I believe there was also signal intelligence that was captured that that indicated that that was the the case. Um, yeah. So, I mean, Bruce really, I think, showed his metal in that the, those final moments. You know, yeah, yeah. Back in that 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 interrogation on selection, the interrogation exercise. Um, yeah, him saying that he would spill the beans if the enemy just did capture him. Well, yeah, he didn't do that. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, he's still, as I mentioned earlier, highly revered at, at Seven Medical Battalion Group. Uh, unfortunately, he's not the last Seven Med member to be killed in action, um, but. That's maybe yeah uh, another video uh, or another legacy conversation. Carry cover those at some stage, but yeah, um, and yeah, I think um, yeah seven med. Uh, I was fortunate enough to visit the unit a few years ago. Um, I was welcomed with uh, with open arms. In fact. They even did a, a free fall demonstration for me and my wife. Um, and I was pleased to find out that the standards at Seven Med, like the standards for the South African Special Forces, um, are still very high. 
you know, you hear a lot about um, other units in the the SANDF um, not sort of living up to the the legacy that they were handed down. But in in Seven Med's case, it would appear that yeah, the standards are still very very high there. Um, so Bruce sort of impacted a lot of different people. You know, living in Australia now, we're, we're fortunate enough to be in a society that reveres their veterans. Uh, we have an Anzac Day march every year, and uh, South Africans are invited to march in that. So at the end of every Anzac march, um, we toast Bruce. One of the uh, individuals that I march with, uh, Angus, um, went to school with Bruce and rode with Bruce yeah, and mm. very, very friendly of Bruce. So Angus and myself have a special toast to Bruce as well on the 15th of September, uh, Anzac Day, Remembrance Day, St. Michael's Day. Yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah, that, that I think is, is pretty much the story as, as, as we know it so far. Yeah. Um, just, I'd like to um, also, Wayne, I'm wearing the medallion. Yeah, maybe I can mention that as well. Yeah. Mention that. Yeah, mention yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. So um, after after I hear the story about, I suppose, capture, in, interrogation, torture, and execution, um, I went out and bought a... a St. Michael's Medal um, and had it engraved with his name, uh, date of, of uh, his uh, death in action, and uh, and also had HCS on it because at that stage thought he'd been awarded the Honoris Crook Silver. And I wore that, that medallion for many years. And then on a visit to Joburg in South Africa when I, I met Debbie, uh, and we were having a long chat about Bruce. I just felt compelled to give her that St. Michael's medallion. Uh, so glad to see that Debbie is still wearing it. And, yep. uh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I, I think, yeah, I didn't know Bruce for too long, but he's just that kind of individual that had a big impact on your life. Um, yeah. And I, I often... Yeah, think that yeah, Bruce did sacrifice his life so that we could have our today. Um, yeah, that that I don't think is over uh, sort of being overly dramatic. Um, and I always think of yeah, uh, John thirteen fifteen, uh, the quote in the Bible which said, "Yeah, uh, greater love have no man than this that he lay down his life for his friends." Because that's what Bruce did. Yeah. Yeah. I think what we can say here that Bruce Whitler has stood the test of time. Yeah. And when he was tested, he did not fail. And we will honor him. And from legacy side, I want to say to the family and Wayne, all of you, our deepest condolences. Be in our prayers. Mm -hmm. I'll definitely remember you on the 15th of, of September. And now here at the end of the video, might I ask all of you who are listening here, bow your heads, think of Bruce Thank Butler. You.
I hope we do justice to Bruce. Baby, I'm so sorry we put you through this again. It's okay. It's okay. Um, I haven't had a a weepy moment for a while, and you know, just going through all the stuff all over again, it does bring back all the memories, you know. And I know that I was strong for my parents, um, but obviously I was grieving for myself. But I had a little daughter of five years old at the time, and you have to carry on. You know, that's life, isn't it? And I, then losing another brother in such a dreadful manner after that was just like, what on earth is happening to this family? Yeah. You know, um, but I fortunately don't suffer from depression. Um, I have Bruce's death actually changed my life because it was the worst thing that had ever happened to me. And um, I try and live a better life because of it. And I, I, Bruce was a kind man. He was a lovable teddy bear kind of chap. He was a, a stand-up guy. He was People liked him, you know, and for good reason. And he was this leader, and he was just such a great guy. And he was my mom and dad's baby. And, of course, we had all left home, so he got all the attention. But he had older parents. He's the kind of youngster that, oh, my parents, you know, they like could be my grandparents kind of thing. In this day and age, it's normal now for children, for, for people to have babies after 40. But in those days, it wasn't, you know. Um, and... Um, but he, they got on well. There was never one thing at, at the, in the Fiddler house. No arguments were allowed at the dinner table. Well, we never argued, actually. Um, there was obviously the odd bit of spattering here and there. But as a family, we actually got on very well. And uh, my mom would just say, excuse me, no arguing at the table. Right, let's carry on. And that's just how it was. And uh, Garth and Michael lost out on quite a lot, I think, with Bruce being much older, and he was the little brother. But for me, I never lost out on anything. And for that, I'm very grateful. Um, my sister, too, she also, she she has regrets because the last time she said that she saw him, they were he was here on one of his weekend passes. And my mom, of course, had a bra, and they went, and Brenda wasn't feeling well. And she said she didn't really pay him too much attention. So, of course, she's got that to live with, you know, which, of course, is horrible. Because she said, why didn't I? I should have tried harder. And although I wasn't feeling well, and we, we all have regrets. And then that's why I think that we need to, from from you learn from this and you, you try not to have regrets. You treat people with the respect that they deserve and that goes for everybody. And yeah. whether they're CEOs of a company or whether they work in your garden or whatever, everybody has deserves respect, you know. And Bruce was like that as well. And that was the thing. He's, when he said to me, I don't know if they like me. I was like, don't be daft. Of course they do. And that, my mom said, they came home, the swimming pool was half empty. It, it was full of bodies. Yeah, because they had just, all the water was out, you know. But they had, had a fun time. And I said, oh, so, mister, I don't think anybody likes me, you know. <laughs> yeah, so that was Bruce showing. This lovely guy. Very, very lovely man. He and Anthony uh, still rode after school. Uh, they were old boys rowing. And... Uh, Anthony actually got him involved in rowing. And then I knew that I was pregnant. And they had been at the lake. And Anthony came in and he said, and? Because in those days you had to have a blood test. So I said, it's positive. Anyway, he came and hugged me. And, oh, he's very excited, everything. And Bruce was like, what's going on? What, 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 what? And, of course, he picked me up and he just spun me around and was so excited and just adored Wendy, of course, when she was born and whatnot. 
He was just lovely. But I'll just quickly tell you the story, which I think I've told way. I think I told him yesterday. When I got married, I got married from home. I, I was living with my parents, and then I got married. And at the end of the reception, everybody puts their arms together, and you go and kiss everybody and thank them for coming and whatnot. And at the end of it is usually the parents and then the bride and groom get in the car and off they, they go. Anyway, about a quarter of the way, Bruce was there with my sister-in-law, Michael's wife, and he picked me up. He was 14 years old and he was already six foot four. And uh, he was like, I'm going to miss you like because you're not going to be there every night and whatnot. He says, but I understand and all of that, but I love you and, you know, okay, well, let me go, you know, let me let you go. But further on down the line, there he was again. And four times he was at the end as well. And he was just, because that's the relationship we had. He just loved me. And, of course, him and, as I say, Anthony were the same. It was just wonderful. He was just he was a lovable guy. And uh, another time we were going to my house, we got out to where the lake was. He was in the car and he had his school uniform in the car. He was in a trick. My car catches the fire. I open the bonnet and it's just like this. Bruce gets out the car and he's standing holding his school uniform. I said to him, Bruce, my car is on fire. He says, well, I... That's why I've taken my uniform out. I said, come and help put out this fire. Well, then he was betwixt and between, because where must he put it, you know, because it was in the evening. It's like, Bruce, the car is aflame. Anyway. <laughs> and he was more worried about his school uniform. Yeah. <laughs> Lovely guy. Wonderful man. Yeah. I miss him. I think that a legacy, you know, is there's a lot of people out here amongst you listening to us now. We are missing people who we lost to death. It's not easy. Let me tell you, you think it ends at, uh, at the funeral? I assure you it doesn't. It does not. It's something you carry with you for the rest of your life. And it should be like that. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it means that the person the deceased was loved and respected. It is, it is the way of life. But there's a lot of these people out there who has never been given an opportunity to speak. So I want to invite everybody here. If you lost somebody during the war, even if it wasn't during the war, but let's say a traffic incident or something, hiking home, come and talk to us. Get your story out there so that we can honor your brother or your sister or your dad or whoever it was. And I want to ask you to... Uh, do you have any advice? Do you have any advice for somebody who's sitting here and who, who remember that one who was taken away from us? Well, in my case, there were, as I said earlier, there were families, uh, parents of other young men that came to visit my parents uh, to to be, to um, tell them that they're not alone and to try and help them get through this um, together. And uh, the one lady said to me, are you Bruce's sister? So I said, yes. So she said, you know, a lot of people came to their house as well and they only spoke to her and her husband. She said, nobody spoke to the children, her children. So she said, I want to talk to each and every one of you individually and tell you how sorry I am and know that we feel your pain and we will always remember your brother. And she, then, I, you know, we spoke obviously a little bit in more detail and then she went on, I took her to my sister and then to my other two brothers. And I thought that was really a good thing. Because it's true, a lot of people only think of the parents, but they were these grandparents, um, our children even, 
who, who, my little daughter was only five. She wasn't really too sure about what was happening. I mean, obviously she knows uh, as she's got older, but everybody, it's, it's, it's all the way down the line. So I would, I'm not afraid, not scared would have been the wrong word. I'm not afraid to, to phone somebody's brother whose brother has just passed away or the grandparent or the whoever of, of the person. Or, and at the funeral, go to them and talk to them and just say, there's no words that you can say about this, and especially if it was a tragic death, um, because it's done, unfortunately, and there's no, in my opinion, there's no such thing as closure. And in both my brother's case, there was no justice either. So... That was even that's even harder. Um, we are very proud of of Bruce having, having done what he did, but we would rather he was here, of course. Um, but learn from it, live a better life, try and live a little a, a better life. Be kind; doesn't cost you anything, but you will never. Forget that person and just take each day as a, at, at a time. And there's no, if it if it works for you this way or this way, I know even in my, my brother and my sister and I, how we are grieving is different. And yet we're exactly the same family. But... Um, you can't say it'll take you five years, two years, and you'll get over it. You never do. You'll never get over it. You learn to live with it. That's all. And just try and do it well. And don't let it be in, let their lives be in vain at your expense if you can perhaps help it. And also, as far as um, feeling guilty, I know that pe some people do feel guilty, but it's n it's not. Please, please don't. Just in our case, Bruce was that way. And no matter what, he would have found a way to have done what he did. So, and unfortunately, he was killed for it, but that's, that's, Bruce. That was Bruce. But I've lost a lot of people along the way afterwards, and we just are there for the family. You assist them. You, you, you constantly keep in touch with them as well. Because once the funeral is over, it all dissipates. Because life carries on, doesn't it? So I like to try and just keep on in contact with those people if I'm able to as much as I can. But it does it does take up a lot of your time because your own life has to carry on as well. So but yeah, that's that's really what I've learned from it. I hope that helps. Well I I think one of the the uh, the big obstacles for people who are witnessing other people grieving is they don't really know what to say. Um, and, yeah, I, I think quite often you don't need to say anything. you just got to be there for them. You, you can sit there in silence with them, yeah. Um, that, that I think, is an important thing, yeah. So, so don't worry about, oh, am I going to say the right thing? Am I going to say the wrong thing? Just be there. Um, and celebrate their life. Yeah, you know, it's not just about the death. I think if you, I, I always like the idea of an Irish wake. In fact, when I go on a big Irish wake, um, because that is about celebrating the life rather than mourning the death. Um, but yeah, you are going to have a period of mourning and and accept that, and that may be forever, right? It may be, but yeah. Uh, yeah, remember their life, remember the legacy that they left. Be worthy of it. Yeah. Um, and yeah, just remember them. Um, 
um, is important because uh, I yeah I believe that if you remember people they are still part of them still lives on right mm -hmm. that that yeah so Philippians um, uh, one three I I thank my God every time I remember you yeah I think is is important as well yeah very important very important but we go through it with God's grace and. Uh... I think at this yeah. note, I want to thank my guests. I want to thank everyone, Bruce, for his services as well. And I want yeah. to say to all of you, until we meet again, God bless. In memory of Bruce Fiddler, Jeremy Sachs and Dr. Johan Nell from Sebamet, who now retired uh, William Mutlin, Debbie Fiddler Moore, and Mark Ashley Adams. Many of the uh, diseased members, two and three para. Thank you for watching. Please like, subscribe, and ring the bell to receive notifications.